<laughs> so it gives me the most media planning pleasure ever to have one of my oldest friends on the Pub and Restaurant Rebirth series. Uh, it's Adam Shufield from Smithfield. Hello. Hi, good morning, Mark. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. We were just talking about No Booze Monday. <laughs> so we, we got through that, which was great. And um, and just to say as well, in terms of, of us, you know, you've been my, my media guy since I was a wee boy. We well, both wee boys, I suppose. Um, back at lastminute.com. And what I thought we would do today was almost do what we did when I first met you, which was just what is media planning? What's it all about? What's the 101? Just so that people can put it into practice. Because I feel that in the hospitality industry, we don't always get a lot of exposure to actually buy in media. And we usually spend a lot of time on the owned channels and maybe the earned channels, but we don't do very much on the paid. So I think it would just be a real great education for everyone to, to have a wee look at it. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. What I've tried to do is get my brain working, which has obviously been in lockdown like everybody else's for a while, uh, and pull together a few slides as, as an aid memoir as such, and we're, we'll pretty much um, freestyle it from there. Um, I've tried to nod to the industry as best I can, uh, and I took some pleasure in watching some of your videos actually in the week warming up to do this and just looking at some of your guides to marketing to, to align myself. But what was really fun was a lot of the case histories you were presenting, I worked with you on them. So it was really nice to see those come to life again against a broader audience. Um, so um, morning everybody, Adam Shufield, media planning and buying agency, the man who likes to spend money. That's my core training, um, is spending money on behalf of clients. Wisely. What, very wise, so <laughs> wisely. Um, we have a very broad, diverse customer database, which includes lots of leisure and retail businesses. Mark and I have worked on food and entertainment brands for the last 15, 20 years together. Um, and we've done everything from the big brand ideas all the way through to the activation, get more footfall into a restaurant, keep the doors open, activity. Uh, and what I've tried to do is bring into this presentation the things we discuss when we're thinking about media planning and clients generally, uh, and some of our bugbears. So I'll try not to labor my points too much, if that's fair enough. Um, what do media agencies do? Well, we like to think that our clients sit in the middle of this process and our core objective is to try and align ourselves to your business and then align ourselves to the target market you're trying to acquire now i'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail but fundamentally when you set up a venue or a site or a restaurant somewhere in that process is an atypical person you think is going to come and trial your product my job is to reach that person at scale and show them your offering. And then if your offering is right for that audience, bada bing, bada boom, they should actually be coming to your location. Uh, and the fundamentals of our business have not changed. The core is the same, and that, that is what a good media planning and buying agency should do for you. We also have ideas and imagination and creativity, but the fundamentals of who am I trying to reach and how do I reach them are the essence of good media planning and buying. So, so the question on everybody's lips is what should I think about first? Um, and I'm gonna go through some of the tools of the trade to give you some ideas around what an agency can bring to the table to help you in this task. And Mark and I have used them a number of times over the years. Um, we've got Experian over here in Mosaic. Um, and this is useful from two fronts, actually. It's helping you understand who lives near your location. So in terms of understanding where you should be marketing on the street and in the local area, by using something like Mosaic, you can look at the postcodes in the area you are, and it will tell you about the people who live near where you work. I think that's particularly relevant when you think about what your offering should appeal to and where you should maximize your time. 
So some people you might choose to reach once a quarter, other people you might choose to reach once a month or even once a week. But by understanding what the footprint of your location is, will give you a better understanding of the opportunity within that area. Now the work Mark and I would do would be based on, we're about to open a location, which place in the high street or in the local area is most relevant for the target market associated with our food or our restaurant or our bar. So in the same way, if you're looking to expand or you're looking to find a new location, very simple for an agency to have a look at the target area you're thinking about or compare multiple areas and tell you, well, if your current customer base looks like this, based on those areas, this one should be your primary objective and the others should be secondary and tertiary. And Mark and I have spent quite a bit of our career trying to fix bad locations. And actually, they say property is all about location, 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 but there's a lot to be said about that in the leisure and the restaurant industry as well. That actually a good location can carry a business proposition a lot further than a bad one. Um, Just to drill into that for a wee sec though, you know, it's a good point is, you know, there's, a lot, there's an awful lot of pressure sometimes to have somewhere in York or Harrogate or Bath or whatever, you know, and then what happens is you, you just end up compromising and you go, I'll take one that's slightly off pitch because we've been trying to get in there for five years and then the numbers stack up because the rent's not as bad, but then there's maybe an expectation that you'll still be as busy as if you had a good pitch, you know, and I just don't think, you know, most of the time that marketing will help fix a bad location well i think to that point mark and you, you'll laugh when i say this if you are going to pick a location which is not in the most perfect position and you're planning that first 12 to 18 months of business and you're doing your business plan and your cash flow analysis and your expectations around business please don't invest all of your money in the fit out and neglect marketing because if you are in a secondary location and you're not obvious then the primary role of telling people you are there is even more important than it would have been normally yeah doesn't matter how amazing you are and how good your product is fundamentally if you don't tell people about it they won't come and trial it you can't create word of mouth without the word at the beginning yeah. And actually, Mark and I know that you need six to 12 months of continuous ongoing marketing support to drive up that three plus usage count across enough people to establish a really strong fixed customer base for your business to keep growing. And I think our experience over the years, that's the one truth that we have learned everywhere. Well, it's the class. Always underinvested. Yeah. Everyone's always going, we don't have enough business, but there's never enough money in the pot to create enough awareness to drive the business forward. Well, it's always 300, 300 grand plus for a fit out. And then it's not even 10% of the fit out cost that they'll put into marketing. So, you know, and then mark, you know, marketing will amount to a bit of PR and a, a you know, a party or whatever. And it's like, you know, I think, I'd be I'd be looking at an awful lot more spend than that. You know, it just it just seems quite ludicrous. It, it's just not enough. And if you think something like a pizza restaurant will reach its audience once a week in, in the house, and you've maybe reached them once when you launched and nobody had ever tried it, it gives you some context that how hard you have to work to drive awareness and repeat purchase. So right at the front end of that process, if you think about just marketing as a whole and whether that's investment in people or product in terms of content or in terms of places to put the content which is media have it there you don't have to spend it if you don't need it we may be wrong you might have the most successful business in the world at which point you can manage that process but if you don't have the flying start and that allocation of spend isn't there then you're fighting a rear guard action almost immediately which is quite challenging um, so 
have a look at Mosaic and Experience and their suite of products. Um, a lot of it's free to use. You can put your own postcode in there and you can find out how the marketing community actually treats you as an individual and a group. Um, another point I try to tell clients is birds of a feather do flock together. And the likelihood is that if you've got a certain type or grouping of customers, your easiest way to grow that business base is to reach more people who look like that. And, and just to understand whether you can or can't is a good thing. And just to say, sorry, when you are, because I've made this mistake a lot of times with you, um, when, and my mistake, when you're capturing data, you know, postcode at the very least, right? If you can get me a postcode, that's brilliant. I don't need household addresses. Um, we can actually match email addresses to postcodes, but it's a lot harder to do and a lot more expensive. Whereas if you've managed to capture an email address, a mobile phone number and a postcode, that, that's pretty fantastic foundation for a, an ongoing marketing strategy. If you can create a database with addresses as well, then that gives you another range of contact and personalized contact, which can support email particularly with hard to contact or non-responsive users, yeah. um, which is also really positive. Um, some of the other tools that we use as a business, um, Nielsen is uh, a very broad media services company, but what it allows us to look at is competitive information. And it does that across every industry, every sector and every type of advertiser. And it allows me to tell Mark when he was at Yo Sushi what Wagamamba was spending how they were spending it on a store by store level, which allows us to understand what we're up against because we're not just up against the number of restaurants a competitor may have, but we're also fighting a share of voice battle. So if somebody has the same amount of restaurants, but is spending twice as much as us, it means everything we have to do has to work two or three times harder to cut through. Yeah. And these are some of the challenges we have on a single unit, or on multiple units is the backdrop for your marketing. Understand the context in which you're operating. And I think on a smaller level, it's how many coffee shops are on your high street? Yeah. How long have they been there? What is their profile? You know, is their positioning different? Have you found an angle which allows you to cut a point of difference across that competitive set? Um, it is a key part of the marketeer's challenge. Um, the other two. Aside, I absolutely love doing this. We, we, you, like, I love knowing what my competitors are doing. I love knowing what they're spending. I love knowing where it's getting spent. Like, it just, it's, and I, again, I don't think enough people are, are looking at that. And you can do that now as well on on the digital channels like Facebook, etc. You can see the transparency of what your competitors are are spending if you pull all that together. Because a great example when we're back at lastminute.com, Expedia outspent us by seven times i think it was yeah. but we're always jockeying for position of number one so it just proves your point you can make smart decisions and you can see that your competitors might even be wasting money yeah it, it's a, it's the zigging and zagging argument yeah everyone's zigging and you can zag then that can be your competitive advantage if your competitive set are using one channel then do you put all of your money into the same channel where you're operating at a disadvantage or do you find another channel which has all the same attributions but without the competitive disadvantage and, and make your spend work harder there? And these are some of the questions and the things media people think about when they're pulling together an advertising and marketing strategy for a client. Yeah. They're taking into account all of these different points before they come up with an answer to your marketing challenge. Um, TGI uh, is a, a lifestyle, 25,000 based lifestyle um, database, which allows us to ask questions of the population. It's uh, demograph, age, and regionally representative of the whole UK population. Uh, and it's like having a bottom drawer with, with people in it. And you can go, how many people eat cornflakes? How many people drive Peugeots? Um, and it's a great way of looking at the potential target market for an area or a product or a thing and then asking them about their habits. What do you read? What do you listen to? What do you watch? 
and it allows us to double check and inform our media plan so that what we recommend to you is much more likely to succeed than just going, let's do a bit of Facebook. Yeah. Let's try some search. Or maybe we should do radio this week. Actually, if you understand what your target market do and how they live their life, then you can be much more informed about how you place their media and, and you'll have less wastage, which means you'll have more reach and more conversion and more sales. And we're shortening the distance between you and those customers. Um, Touch Points is an IPA lifestyle database and it's a build on to TGI and it actually allows us to look at by hour of day, by day of week, how people live their lives. So you can start understanding where you could fit within a busy consumer's lifestyle or a not so busy consumer's lifestyle. And we can run that across a plethora of questions. So these four products allow us to provide a fantastic window into where you are, who your customers should be, who they currently are, and how they can interact and engage with you as a business. And all of this should make it easier for your business to succeed. Brilliant. Or highlight challenges that you may have. All right, we're gonna skip that and we're gonna skip that. Too much detail, we're gonna skip that. Right, okay, so target markets. Um, customers, potential customers, where they live, habits, frequency, pen portraits. This is what comes out of using those tools to deliver product. So if you're an existing restaurant and you have a database or a location, we work with Alexandra Palace, we understand who their customers are, where they come from, how they change by product, by time of year, where they live, how the migration patterns change based on the type of product that we're trying to sell. Fireworks is very different to the summer festival, to a food festival, their music events have a completely different profile to the rest of the business. And we understand all of those. Um, Hollywood Bowl, we understand by product, by location, by time of day, by day of week, who their customers are. And we actually have a tailored marketing plan for each of those audiences. So on every level, that marketing spend is maximizing its reach, its engagement, and also its conversion through to bookings. So we're, we're following that investment all the way through to conversion. Now, obviously, when we're working with a restaurant, that's much harder to do. Because obviously, we're reliant on you to tell us about football. We're reliant on EPOS, till systems old databases, databases that aren't clean, managers who aren't engaged. So we do understand that it's not straightforward or simple. However, there, there are ways now, I mean, for example, if someone was using something like a wireless social, yes, and you've, you know, you could start completing the loop by knowing that person, if there's a way to sort of triangulate the information to then identify that as, as the customer you're talking to, EPOS, you know, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but there might be some ways, yeah, you know, that, that are around now without, remember like back in the day we were trying to get eye beacons or before that, even Bluetooth things and everything, and it was just wildly expensive at the time. But, you know, with things like wireless social and stuff, I, I think, you know, there's, there's maybe a way without having a all booking restaurant or offer. And I think the challenge we still have, and I have today with current clients, is tracking back a promotion or an incentive to the till yeah and measuring how many people used it and ticking them off and and, and that hasn't changed you remember at yo we invented a a tech system that gave everyone a unique code so yeah. we had to write a piece of software that when they were responding to one of our ads and i think it was text the word sushi to 7891 yeah, that's right we then sent them back not only a voucher which they could redeem in store for a free plate of sushi, but so it would work with the tills, each text had a unique identifier on it. Yeah. Now I haven't seen that since. <laughs> and I think we were the first one to, to have that made when we did it. Yeah. And it's the only way we could get the promotion away because we could control it. Yeah. And we're going to talk about automation later because I think whether you're a small or medium sized business or even a large business. Um, we as an agency talk about filling buckets. Our core job is often acquiring customers. 
Um, and more and more we're talking about how marketing not only acquires customers, but it also activates customers you already know. So people who have never met you versus people who have been in once or twice but haven't returned, how marketing can be effective against both segments. Yeah. Oh, I'll go and try that. Oh, oh, yes, we should go back there. And it's, it's those two things. But this holy trinity of, of marrying up your marketing tools needs a lot more thinking about from businesses as they start up. So how do I coordinate my Wi-Fi with my email, my social media and, and my direct mail to get the best return? So that when I do something, I can see what happens and then do more of it or less of it, depending on the effect. Um, and I think it's about how much time have you got or have you got somebody in the business who can manage this for you that can give it the time of day it needs to make it work. Otherwise, it's a huge commitment. You know, it is an hour or two hours a day of, of managing these things on top of your core job, which is facilitating, managing, setting up, post, you know, all of those other jobs that, that are so important. Um, and I think what I try and teach my teams are that we are less than 10 to 15% of a marketeer's time. Whereas we think we're the most important and we should get 100% of your time and you should all engage with us all of the time. Yeah, yeah. But actually, we're right at the end of that process when somebody goes, we'll book some media now. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a bit much earlier on, which is about the connectivity of media, um, which is much harder to do. And if you're managing multiple agencies, it's even more of a burden. Because we're all very good individually, but we're all plowing our own field, if you like. Yeah. And you've got to be be the farmer, or there'll be no cohesion between these different crops. Um, so, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so, by doing the things we've talked about, and by you trying to look at where you are, who your current customers are, it should give you an insight into where you should be aiming your marketing and I think that could be also in tone of voice imagery um, typographically you know your signage yeah. you shouldn't be using black and gold if if you are green and orange you know it's things like that which, which all come out of this understanding of who my customers are or who I want them to be yeah. and you can shorten that distance between you and them very quickly I think a good adage is, should I open a restaurant in a food type that there aren't any of, where you could say, that's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. But the reverse of that is nobody wants to eat that type of food. You know, is, is there an overexposure of Peruvian food? Because we've gone from one to many. And actually, how often do you want to fit Peruvian food into your, your menu of different food types? Whereas pizza is still the most um, popular food delivery, even on delivery and these other takeaway services. Old habits die hard. So even trying to get people to try and discover is, is challenging. Um, but by understanding who your customers are or should be, it allows you to aim messages at them and drive that consideration and trust. Yep. Um, so, but how do we reach them? Um, Put yourself in the shoes of your audience. So we talk about pen portraits, and what we try to do at the end of that process is to give a customer a pen portrait of who that customer should look like, what they read, where they shop. You know, are, are they a little shopper? Are they an Asda shopper? Are they a Waitrose shopper? Do they read the Sunday Times or do they read the Daily Mail? Um, do they watch ITV or do they use Netflix? And actually by using some of these types of things, you get a sense of, oh, I kind of recognize that person now. Yeah. And that may be because you have more guardians left in your location at the end of the day than you do daily mouth. It may be the type of books you see people reading when they're in there, or the people they're hanging around with. It could be the fact they've got a big beard and everyone else hasn't. Yeah. So by thinking about that, you can then, try and think about, well, what do these people consume? Now, obviously that can be location-based. You know, are they coming into work? Which means, are they using a tube or a bus? 
Yeah. Or do my customers come during the day so they all work at home locally? I mean, that's even more relevant today than it was a few weeks ago. But clearly, you've got different audiences at different times of the day and different types of messaging is effective against them. But you, there's a couple of things in this, right? You taught me early on, almost like follow them all day in your head. You know, what do they do when they get up? You know, what's their habits and routines? Are they listening to the radio in the shower? You know, at the time it was probably a disc and not an iPod when we were working. <laughs> but you know, are they listening to music on the way? Are they picking up a paper? Are they, you know, and, and, and the other massive point here is take yourself out of the equation as a as a as a person. Your personal opinion means nothing. You know, look at the data, understand, and as you say, you know, walk a mile and, and put yourself in that other person's shoes because so much of the time, I had it, it was a classic, we're working with a holiday company a wee while ago, and because the marketing department was all pretty much, you know, Greater London or Wimbledon and, and all the rest of it, they were trying to make this brand something it wasn't. Mm. They were trying to make it middle class, Bowden, Pims, you know, whatever, she, she. But it isn't, it was, you know, an ITV brand through and through. So, I think, you know, when I asked a shopping brand and all the rest of it, and I, I think that's the biggest mistake. You know, marketers are dangerous when they do that. Yeah, it's either the, the need to appeal to everyone, which is impossibly difficult to do, yeah. or an aspiration to be something you're not. And actually, by understanding out of those 100 customers, which 20 are the most profitable, and finding out how many of those exist so that you can target more advertising at the most profitable ones, yeah. Can you grow that segment? And that's where marketing gets really exciting because it becomes much more surgical. And a lot of the tools we have today allow us to do that sort of work where we can just reach that 20% with post, digital, television, radio, almost one-on-one. -on -one. And suddenly you can really see the benefit of that happening as the most profitable segment of your business grows and you're not ignoring the rest, but you're aiming your marketing where you're going to get the most return from it. And yeah. super important what you've said here as well. Where do you fit in? Again, drop the ego. You're not the most important thing in this person's life, probably. You know, but how can you add value to that person's life and fitting in at the, the right time or getting a message to them at the right time without, yeah. you know, just sort of, you know, shouting at them? So I think, you know, it's, it's definitely forget personal opinion and, and drop the ego for sure. Yeah, finding space is hard because I think, you know, we see thousands of messages a day. We are very good at selecting ones that are only relevant to us. So it's amazing how that when you suddenly decide you need a new car or you need a new washing machine, you suddenly start seeing car ads and washing machine ads. Well, technology is also imparting that because it sees your habits change in line with your need. Yeah. But your brain is also opening up your your blinkers to that type of messaging. Whereas 11 months of the year, you, you're, you're completely agnostic towards those because it doesn't matter whether you love the news or not, you don't need a washing machine, you're not going to take on board their messaging and you don't need it. Um, and that's another huge challenge for the marketeer. Um, just a bit of detail here to give you a, uh, a sense of how people consume marketing. Um, on the left, we've got reach. So this is how many of the whole do something. And on the right, we've got the number of hours a day which they do it. And this gives you a real sense of how hard media or communication tools have to work to reach people. So to give you some context here, you know, we talk about social media and I know Lots of clients are very active in social media. Um, they, they commit a huge amount of their time and, and their wealth to engaging in it and pushing messages out in it. And it has pretty good reach at 70%, but you know we've still got an hour, hour and a half of somebody's day using social media. So it is in its own right, not the answer. It is part of a communication plan which allows you to find space in that person's day to deliver a message. Um, and obviously up here we've got things like outdoor. Well, clearly 
mobile audiences who are going about their business tend to go outside. So the idea of if I find a poster near where my location is, I've got the opportunity to convince people to trial my product is a pretty good one for what we do. And Mark and I will bang on about A boards all the time because we love them because they're as good as they get if the council will let you put them out. And I think you know, Mark and I were very proud when we managed to get the, 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 the only two phone boxes in Oxford Street outside of Topshop um, and sending people into a Yo Sushi, which was in effect hidden from its target market. Um, and we saw a 20% plus uplift in footfall by that 200 pound every two week poster. Yeah. Um, it wasn't enough to save the location, unfortunately, which was a beautifully designed and laid out restaurant, but just marvelously unsupported in terms of marketing. We just couldn't get enough people into it. Um, but the power of putting that poster and just saying to people, sushi here. That's literally what it said, I think, wasn't it? Just yeah, an arrow. We actually put an arrow in an ad. I mean, well, we took inspiration from McDonald's, didn't we? You know, we, we were the like, McDonald's can't be wrong, can they? With yeah. What they do. And it was like, well, your sushi's pretty well known in London for sure. Let's give it a go. But we ended up using it. We used that campaign in Brindley Place. Yes. Uh, Bath, maybe as well. Ages. The locations that were just a little bit off. Um, and you had to sort of just get people there, you know? And, that, and you know, we talk about launching and having budgets for a launch where you, you, you've built this amazing thing. You've, you've opened the doors clearly you then need to tell a world audience that you're here and to try it and then you need to revisit that on a regular basis so you keep telling people the same messages to reinforce it um we'll talk more about individual channels a bit later as i touch on some detail but i think for the industry we're in outdoor is hugely attractive and obviously the advent of digital outdoor means you can be time of day tactical you can target off peak versus peak you can drive footfall when there isn't footfall yeah. you can tie that into digital so if you know you're busy from 8 to 10 but you're quiet from 10 30 to 4 it allows you to switch on a marketing campaign which is only active across that day part yeah so you've got your in-store segment where you can tell people to come back during the day and get this amazing offer and then you've got people who haven't been in at all that you can reach with your above the line and try and get them to come and try your sandwich of the day or your special or whatever that message you're supporting is and, and, and there isn't enough of that um, and it's the sort of work we would all like to be doing and it's finding the space to do it um, I think the challenge in London is hard because there's so much competition and actually give me a regional operator and it makes my life much easier yeah there's less competition we don't have share of voice and we're not competing for posters that are sold 12 years around to mcdonald's yeah so actually it's much harder to cut through in london than it is the rest of the country um but people always target london because there's such a massive footfall there yeah, um, but if you can build a reputation in a smaller area, you're, it's almost easier to succeed. Um, we've got television up there, and we'll talk about that in detail, particularly how we can now have household television. And I think that can be particularly relevant to um, medium to large sized operations where you've got multiple locations, where you can start using broadcast to support your businesses. Radio is doing fantastically well at the moment. Commercial radio has never been so strong. Um, and then you've got the... What, why, why is that with commercial radio? Commercial radio hasn't still only got about 60% reach. But at yeah. the right time of day or against the right audience, it's really, really relevant. Um, and you can see podcasts down here still got quite a long way to go. The same with cinema. Um, but, you know, I think cinema, which is now 100% digital, and what that means is we don't have to go and print negatives for adverts, mm. and we can buy cinema by cinema. So if you're in a town, and there's a cinema in your town, well, you can have an ad on the screen in that cinema for probably 
five, six hundred pound a month. Now, if you did that for a year to support a new location, over that year, you're going to reach multiple audiences, multiple segments, and you're going to drop that idea of, well, you should have had your meal before the film or after the meal in this location. Um, so it's about, we look at this all the time. So as the market changes, we have lots of new opportunities come to us. So as a process, it's something you could do quarterly or half yearly. What are we doing? Can I do it better? Is there something I haven't tried or I should try again or I'm not doing well enough? And that, that's kind of the rigor a marketer, I suppose, does all the time. And it's what your agency should be helping you to do. Um, I thought you'd like this, Mark. And, uh, <laughs> that looks good, yeah, I like that one. That's a great one. So when I present, I often talk about dartboards and the center of dartboards. And, and I was writing a marketing strategy for a food client the other day, and I, I came back to this because I thought so much of our time together is in here, and it makes such perfect sense Yeah, that it's a great way to start. And there, there are so many opportunities to add within this um, and to draw it all together. I mean, the idea of create demand, immediate area, you know, you've got door drops, you've got posters, you've got leaflets, you've got promo people, um, you've got cinema now, you can use um, ad smart. So each aspect of this, you can use media to support it, help it and grow it. Yeah. And you can use technology to hold it all together. And I think the most successful locations, restaurants, businesses are the ones doing this. They've understood the relationship between frequency, reach, timing, and target market, and they're bringing it together in a homogenous way, which allows them to support and grow their business through good times and tough times. And I know we're going to hit a tough period. And, and coming out of this and my business is massively affected because of the number of healthcare businesses and leisure businesses I work with. Yeah. So this type of work becomes all the more important. It's what's obvious and what haven't I thought of and getting those two things right are really, really important. Um, and then the, the, this, this idea of owned, earned and paid. So as a business, we're on the paid side. You know, my job is to take the owned and the earned and grow it. We bring more people into your field of reference. If you've only got a hundred friends, there's not a lot of reach. Yep. But for three pound fifty, I can turn that into a thousand friends. So it's understanding when to support what you've got with more to grow it and cost effective growth. Because through reach we grow trial, for more trial, you've got more frequency, for more frequency, you've got a larger customer base. And that means you are less dependent on marketing because you've grown that base effectively. But you can't walk away from it because you've got to refresh it and keep it new and tell new stories and keep talking to people. So it's very, very important. Um, I think that's a great point though, the fact that paid will feed owned and earned. Yeah. Because a lot of people will be thinking, that with paid is you know here today gone tomorrow but that's a nice thought is that you know every pound euro dollar whatever you're spending on paid will actually help you have you know a bigger opportunity to speak to your own audience and earned audience which is worth investing in and we talk about it in search actually and we talk about share of impressions um, and, uh, there's always a good debate about should I support brand or do I not need to support brand? Does SEO do it effectively? But even within a search marketplace, just being in that competitive set allows you to put your brand against your competition. And if you weren't bidding on terms, whether you're being clicked on or not, you wouldn't have that share of impression and you wouldn't be putting your place in that competitive set. Um, I think I'd always bid on my brand terms. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, very proud of it. We, we got into a big thing about it when I worked at We 7 And, you know, there was a lot of, you know, financial chat about why you shouldn't do it and stuff. But I just always think it's like, that's your, that's your 
back door, you know, don't don't lose to your home crowd, you know, just protect that. And also it gets you more on the page, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean it's about out. owning the page. It also allows you to control what you're serving. Yeah. So what's well, you know, that little box where you've got your four key messages? Yeah. Really, that that's copy. Yeah. That that's a window. That that's a messaging. That's that allows you to what are the four things you want them to see under your name? Value, range, service, yeah, sure quality. Right. You know, you know, or, or meal of the day, or what you know, and that copy can change by time of day, day of week, even by the type of people who have searched for it. You know, is it part of a retargeting strategy? Is it part of acquisition? You know, the, the detail around just that is amazing. But um it, it is key outside of this owned and owned to, to have some money for growth. Yeah. The best the best they paid thing we ever did at lastminute.com was uh, we had a whole bunch of Lionel Richie tickets we were trying to get rid of. So the boys wrote the copy line, hello, <laughs> is it Lionel Richie <laughs> tickets you're looking for when you went to lastminute.com and when you searched for Lionel Richie and all that. So that was that was kind of, you can have some fun with it as well, you know. It's great. It's like when we had people for the theatre awards running around town in top hail and, and, and hats and, you know, just the amount of leafleting and just getting people out and about and, and the japarazzi you know that's fantastic yeah. character yeah. personality and and with the launch of every store we were there and, and you need to bring a brand to life uh, and that's a great way of doing it um what who was the dj we worked with oh jaguar skills oh it was brilliant that yeah. was you remember that big night we had outside of <laughs> yeah fantastic a whole street party yeah, that was there was a there must have been, I don't know, at least five hundred people, right, or more. Yeah, right. and um, yeah, for for the launch and you know, Carluccio's was super pissed off, and um, <laughs> you know, all the all the restaurants around us were just raging. The pub was raging, yeah, because you know, we just had the whole place going. But it's, yeah, it's still on YouTube. The, the video it's great. But if you want to create value in your own and own then you need to project and exploit ideas and events like that. So by supporting that content that you've slaved over and you've crafted and looks fantastic, give it its opportunity to find the right audience. Because if you've done the earlier work and you know who your customers are, then you're going to get great return on showing more people who look like your customers. Look, these people love it. You should join us. The likelihood is they will do. Yeah. So think about that. Have something left in your ammunition so that you've got that sense of reach towards an event or a launch or a location or the new menu. New menus, new news. Yeah. What's the special of the week? You support it with email. Why don't you tell more people? Yeah. You might find a whole group of people who like macaroni cheese and didn't know you made it. It, it sounds ridiculously simple, but actually new news is news <laughs> it's good so you know just try and think about that it, it, you know it doesn't always have to be hugely expensive but it can be really effective um, and we'll talk about some costs later um, I think this is an interesting point and and if we think back to the local marketing chart and when we go through the menu or selection of ideas that we can use for a location or an event or a restaurant or a coffee bar. What we're going to see there is how much something costs versus its reach. Yeah. And different channels have different costs based on the way they talk to audiences. Um, and, and, you know, what we try to do as a business is we can bring them all down to the same level. So you can compare those channels and debate where you're getting best return. Yeah. So um, if we think about, we're all familiar with the term cost per click and different sectors. If we're in the insurance sector, it could be 50 pound. If we're in uh, the gambling sector, it could be up to 150 pound per click. Um, some markets are pound a click, 30 p a click, and it varies. But you know, it's Google tax because you're effectively putting a front door outside of your business. And every time somebody wants to come in, you're paying for the benefit of that. Yeah. Hence the importance of SEO. But that cost per click 
or that cost per reaching somebody is the key measure of what we're looking at. So if we're looking at something like a door drop, which is going to have a cost per thousand and forty five pound, whereas AdSmart is comparable at forty five pound upwards, depending on your targeting. Uh, you've got something like radio, which may be between two and three pound. Your yeah. TV is between on a larger scale area could be traded at between two pound fifty and anything up to twenty pounds. So posters tend to have a low cost per thousand because they have a great deal of reach. They're non-selective. Everybody, you can't stop people who aren't going to be customers walking past them. Radios are dictated by their their coverage area and the, and the profile of the people who listen to it. You can't exclude the people that you don't want to reach. Whereas when we talk about digital well, then you can start to become much more selective as we look at purchasing habits and the way people behave to trigger that. So when you're looking at your marketing plan and you're trying to work out, is it good value for money? Look at how many people you're reaching for the money you're spending. So I might say to you, it's only 2000 pounds and you'll go brilliant, Adam, I can afford that. That's really good. But it's only reaching 300 people. Yeah. So your cost per thousand or your cost per action is going to be disproportionately high. Direct mail, £120 per thousand. But it's a very powerful channel because it's into somebody's home with their name and address on it. So it's highly responsive. Mm. Whereas a broadcast medium where it's not personalized, but it has a statue of appearing on the screen in your TV, it's selective. The challenge we have within a digital environment and with the social environment, it's aimed at us, but we haven't decided to see it, and we can look at everything else around it. Yeah. Skippable, transferable, non-engaged. It's how you interrupt that advertising cycle, the editorial cycle to engage with the audience. So in feed native, supporting standard Facebook formats, which can offer incremental reach, allows you to deliver video, you know, sells off them you know there's so much range within these things that you really need to understand how many people i'm going to see for that money and also how likely they are to engage with the messaging how powerful is it it's the idea of being on the early front half right hand page in a national newspaper or my local metro is a pretty powerful thing and we've seen the difference to a promotion when you get it in the metro or you buy an ad to one that you're just supporting in the store. So again, it's about giving it reach um, and understanding what level of coverage and reach you're getting for the amount of money you're spending. And that's something you can build into all your communications. You know, your emails have a serving cost. They've got a design cost. So, you know, what's the cost per thousand? What, what did you put in to reach your database? Well, I, I think there's another bit there as well, you're right, which is, you know, if you even look at social, organic, and you think about the time it took your team to pull a post together, and how many people A, did that reach and B, reacted in any way, I, I bet it would be off the charts, crazy. Um, the Particularly if you're not giving it some paid support, so the reach is effectively very limited. Yeah. So if you want to get better return on all of that capital investment you've put in to get that post ready, it may be actually a very small amount on top of what you've currently already invested to double or treble or quadruple your reach for that post. Yeah. At least you know if people engage with it, they become part of the fold. So next time they're that much cheaper to reach. Yeah. There is some really good pure logic around that. What we find is the industry is, is absolutely split. I, I you know, I, I do paid, but I don't actually do organic. And then all the people over here do all the organic, but they don't do paid. And it's yeah. it's an interesting rub, but they are very different skills. Mm -hmm. sure. Um, so let's have a look at some channels specifically. And, and clearly there's a huge amount of detail we could go into. Um, and I'm not going to. I'm just gonna try and touch on on how some of these channels work and the selectivity we have so that whether you happen to be somebody with a location 10 locations or 
50 or 100 locations, you get a sense of how these different channels could be applied individually or at scale. Um, so clearly we have here the traditional TV operator, we've got ITV, Channel 4 and Sky, um, the selectivity within them, um, we've got all of the TV regions which can then be broken down to transmitters. We've got Channel 4 which again allows us to segment the country and then we've got Sky that replicates all of the ITV regions um, on a broadcast level. Um, and the cost for reaching a third of Birmingham is actually very low because Birmingham has three transmitters. Mm -hmm. The cost of reaching Manchester is disproportionately low than trying to do it in London. I'll make you famous in Scotland because <laughs> yeah. so many more people watch television in Scotland than they do everywhere else because of the bad weather that the ability to oh, reach them is well. less. <laughs> so, the regional variances here can make a huge difference to a business because what broadcast gives you is scalable, cost effective reach. It's a relatively low cost per thousand yeah. and it can be targeted to the people you're trying to reach and it can do it en masse. And that's a key point that a lot of the time we're not spending enough to get the effect we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Particularly if we're not as engaging as we think we are. So you want as much bang for your bucks as you can if you're going to try and get that best return at the bottom end of that communication funnel start big to get the effect if you start really small it's got to work so much harder yeah. to get the return you're looking for from that investment um we're going to touch on ad smart which is, is a fantastic piece of technology it's very very clever um we're seeing a lot more regional advertisers use it specialist marketers using it um we use it a lot for very hard to reach target markets uh, and we use it for hyper-local marketing. I think what your agency should be talking to you about are the, the two challenges associated with the product and that it's still got limited reach. So on face value, it might look very good value. Yeah. But when you look a bit deeper, you, you find out it's only reaching half of the potential audience you need it to reach, which means you need to think about what it's working with. The other thing to remember about Sky Ad Smart is traditional TV goes out with a spot and it reaches a large number of people at a time. So a small spot can do a uh, hundred people, a big spot on Coronation Street can do 30% of the population. Yeah. Ad Smart is a household level product. So on day one, 10 people might see it. On day two, a hundred people might see it. By the end of your campaign, 6,000 people might have seen it four times. So it is very much not gonna have that bang effect that you might need to support your promotion or the launch of a restaurant or an event or a certain thing. So it, it pairs very well with radio because radio can cover in those coverage holes and, and, and can rise the frequency. It's very good when it's supporting direct mail or, or door drops or things like that. So very much embrace it because it can be very cost efficient. And I think the minimum spend is, is only about two and a half K. So it's accessible for lots of brands. Yeah. But just be very aware of, of what it's delivering you and how it fits in the overall mix. Mm -hmm. um, and I think still today, my main conversation with clients is, they naturally have a barrier to using broadcast because they think it's very expensive. And what we try to explain is that developing content, the cost has reduced massively. Yeah. A lot of the assets you already own with the business are transferable. Mm -hmm. What TV does is it gives you a much bigger stage to show your offering on at a relatively reduced cost. So on a cost per thousand basis, it's very competitive versus all of the other channels we've talked about. Yeah. And if you're trying to create a mass effect and you've got something that people aren't going to, then it's a pretty good way of suddenly 
making change. Sorry. That's the office phone. <laughs> um, but to give you a sense of how powerful TV is, and this is a, a piece of this. I don't know how to stop that. <laughs> um, piece of research from Thinkbox, um, and it just shows you the effect words and moving pictures have together. And some of the other limitations that other channels have are the fact they don't have the emotive qualities that broadcast can deliver. I think the only channel that really is more powerful but has limited reach is cinema. Yeah, so where else can you lock somebody in a room, switch the lights out, and show them your ad? Yeah. What are they going to be looking at? And that's always been the power of cinema. The phone. <laughs> Annoyingly. <laughs> not many, not many. But the next one down from that is TV, because even, you know, digital just doesn't have that, because you're yeah. doing lots of other things. You're interrupting, whereas here, the ads are part of the process. Yeah. And interestingly, through lockdown, what we've seen is a huge increase in commercial viewing. And it's not just Amazon, it's not just Netflix. In fact, we've seen one of the largest increases in younger age breaks coming to traditional broadcast. So that's ITV, that's Channel 4. That, that's not just YouTube. Uh, and and it, it's really, really important. Um, so lots of strengths um, uh, for TV, mass, audio, visual, it's emotional, it's intrusive, you can target it. It, it, you know, we can demonstrate effects. It immediately delivers credibility and worth to a brand. So if you're an e-tailer or, or you've got a, a to-home product, suddenly you can offer reach and credibility to something nobody may ever have heard of before. I saw it on TV, so it must be okay. Yeah. Uh, it can deliver very high levels of awareness. So the think of the power of that in launching a new product or a type. Um, it's got a relatively low cost per thousand um, and it creates desire. So of all the channels we've talked about, including every form of digital, over a one to three year period, nothing will give you a better return on investment than television. And I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but... Yeah. Something to bear in mind, yeah. it's accessible, it's usable, and it's deliverable. And we should be doing more of it if only our clients would let us exploit their products in this way. Um, I think super relevant to us is outdoor. The advent of digital and data has revolutionized this industry. Um, we take McDonald's by as an example, multiple locations, mass distribution, a huge ongoing foot foundation in outdoor. And with the advent of digital outdoor and live data, 40 to 60% of their ongoing outdoor distribution is changed monthly or hourly based on where it knows people are walking. Yeah. So if you think historically we'd buy a poster, we'd leave it there for two weeks. And we generally go, well, that's the biggest hotspot, so to put it there, we can now see where your com competition are eating. So if I want to target Kentucky Fried Chicken customers, I can tell you which six posters in a town or an area reach that audience. So if you're competing with another type of food or another brand, we can put your ad in front of the people who eat at your competition. Yeah. So you can tell them your chicken's better or you've got better kebabs or or whatever that, or you've got the best coffee in town, or whatever that USP is. And, and the advent of digital is we can do it in real time. We can do it in line with your football, with your menu changes. So there's a lot more fun to be had with outdoor in this sector. Yeah. And it can really be exploited. It could really bring to life what people are already doing in Windows and on A boards, and take that out to a broader audience, which I think is really exciting. Um, it's still traditionally sold in two week periods, but obviously digital can be bought anytime you want. Um, so you can have it always on, but only for two hours a day. You can really mess around with how you do that. Um, 
the biggest challenge in this market is availability. Yeah. So gone are the days, Mark, when I can pick up a phone and do a deal and I have you covering London in two weeks time, which is what we did with last minute so fantastically well. Um, I've now had times when I've phoned up and been told we are fully sold. Yeah. And I've never had that in my career before. So it just means we're talking to clients about thinking six to 12 months ahead, which seems impossibly ridiculous. But if you know you've got a location and there are only five posters in that area, that's not hard to think six months ahead because when that poster becomes available, you want to be on it. Yeah. I think we waited over a year for that ad on Oxford Street. Yeah, we were, we were about a year, yeah. Yeah, so we, we would have identified it, we knew it was there, and we just waited. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really important. Less so with digital, which can be very um, last minute, it can be very tactical, and it can be traded short term. So there are opportunities in that in the media. Um, and it has the, lots of the power of television because it's a broadcast medium. It does have stature. It's a great showcase for your creativity. It really allows you to build awareness against a mass audience and tell people you've arrived. Yeah. So, you know, with somebody like Hollywood Bowl, we we'll always launch with a 48 sheet or a 96 sheet in the local area. And we'll support that with radio. We might use door drops. And then the glue to all of that is digital. You'll have social running, you'll have native running, and we'll have digital display running. And it's that mix of old and new that is creating that ball of awareness, driving engagement on footfall at the start of a new location, which equals sales. Yeah. Um, some costs, which I thought people would just be intrigued by, actually. Um, <laughs> so top right hand corner, we've got a six sheet, which is a traditional ad you see at a bus stop. It's the one you see walking around town, probably the one you're most familiar with. And in London, you know, four to 800 pounds. So it's a much bigger capital investment than it would have been back in the day. For two weeks. For two weeks. Um, but as we get outside of London, there's much more value to be had. And, and the nice thing about posters is they build them where people are. Yeah. So the very fact you've got a poster near you means there's enough footfall around you to justify that location of a poster. Um, there are actually less 48 sheets than there were five years ago. So all the best 48 sheets are being turned into digital sites. A lot of the C and D grade 48 sheets are just not there anymore. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, we used to be able to buy packs of low grade 48 sheets, which we call cover packs, and they would just give you volume around your outdoor strategy much harder to find now hence this idea of time and being able to pick what you need is very important um, 96 sheets are these amazing fantastic um, sites in in high football motoring areas you get some fantastic ones in all the major cities so the idea of using one of these particularly a digital one for a day on the launch of your new location yeah. or a week proceeding it to it or building a database, you know, register now for our pre-launch event. This is the type of media you can use really effectively to support those individual locations at scale. At what is a relatively low cost. Um, and then sort of mass volume, low cost phone kiosks. Now we won't talk about what their main usage in London is nowadays, but they still offer a very good low cost high street support for lots of different environments and if you're a local unit or a local store you can buy one yeah so maybe once a quarter think about a change of menu put it up say you've got a new menu or a new offer or a special and just increase that that reach of your business and try and bring new people into the fold um i think london underground anyone in london is obsessed with london um, London Underground offers a fantastic way into the population of London when we're not in this current situation it's one of the main ways we get around it offers a huge range of formats traditional paper and paste as well as electronic 
uh, and what it delivers is fantastic frequency because we tend to use it a minimum of twice a day. A two week campaign on the underground gives you a very high frequency at a very low cost per thousand. Um, and if targeting your local station, particularly outside of zone one and two, can be fantastically cost effective. Yeah. Um, I think anyone operating in London will be familiar with tube car panels. And I think they seem to be the default choice of, of digital and e-com businesses at the moment. We'll buy a pack of tube car panels and we'll use that to launch our presence. And that's because it does deliver very good reach with a high dwell time at a relatively low cost. They still work, you know, and, and I think the ones that work the best for me a lot of the time is the ones that are kind of like, two things sat together. You know, there's been a real thought about trying to get a continuous campaign or juxtaposing ads or just something next to each other. Yeah. It always works. Surely branded face masks has got to happen, doesn't it? Branded what, sorry? Face masks. Yes, no, yeah, for sure. Have, you know, have, on. I think if you could get them, yeah. then people would certainly take them and you could walk around with messages. It, it, it. It, it's quite yeah. an interesting proposition. Um, I think, you know, to give you some context, it's still 45 grand upwards to have a, 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 a low weight tube car campaign in London. You know, and that's going to be out of the reach of lots of businesses, um, particularly if you're not as accessible as you would be as a dot com business. But you know, if a, a, an escalator panel at your local station is 50 pounds for two weeks, suddenly that's very accessible. Yeah. Um, and actually, even if you're not using an agency, um, you can buy that direct. You know, access to a lot of this sheet is improving. So, you know, you, you can find it if you want it. Um, and then when we get it to outside of London, you know, we've still got um, rail. All of the stations have great opportunities to reach that commuter audience. Um, and then on the high street buses, you know, bus backs, fantastically good at reaching a local audience. And super size, a great way of having an always on message in a high street. Yeah. And the way we buy buses is we, we pick the route. So if you do have a location, we can pick the route where the bus drives past your location every day. Yeah. Um, and, and I've used that very successfully over the years where I've taken people off of uh, a high cost broadcast campaign and, and used buses or outdoor to replicate the same strategy at a reduced cost. Um, and then taxis before the advent of Uber, um, obviously a fantastic way to reach people on the high street by buying super sites, but also by people actually in the taxis. And they're very different audiences uh, and something worth considering. Um, and there are lots of other outdoor formats I'm not even touching upon yeah. that may be relevant to an individual location or space. Uh, we can get into lobbies, lifts, um, you know, so the more you think about it, the more of these come to mind. My, my newest one is chicken shops. So there's a great new chicken shop uh, advertising medium, digital signage in chicken shops, which is reaching that whole hard to reach youth audience, which has been ignored and has migrated away from traditional channels. That's really smart. So you've got Nike, Reebok, games, cinema, film. They've immediately seen, well, this is brilliant. I've got a high dwell time and a hard to reach audience at a very low cost. You just got to get your head around the fact your ad's going to appear in a chicken shop. It's fine. <laughs> um, so some of the tactical stuff we use for store openings and where we can't buy a poster, and we also use them to ir irritate other customers. Um, you know, mobile signs, ad vans, park them outside of your competition, have them driving around the local area, parked outside the chairman's house. Um, you know, mobile six sheets, driving around a town, supporting a store opening for the day, delivering a tactical message, relatively low cost, very cost efficient. Um, and then some other rail formats here. Um, train panels can be fantastically good. They're much more impactful than bus panels, particularly on national rail. And then you've got some really good, relatively low cost advertising opportunities at station. Um, well worth investigating. Uh, and then bus panels are making a bit of a resurgence. The production is quite hard on them, but rears are a great product as are street liners. Um, and then in London, you've got the bus packs, which again deliver 
what is a broadcast presence in one of the most expensive towns in the UK to advertise in at a relatively low cost. And there's a Pret taxi. Yay. And we use yeah. these outside of London uh, when we're opening other stores, um, generally not in London itself. Um, but as you can see, they can be relatively cost efficient and very tactical. Okay, so let's have a look at radio. Um, it's a medium that, that, that has always taken a back seat, really, versus outdoor and television. Um, it's doing very well at the moment because of commercial, commercial listenership. Consolidation of ownership has improved product, and digital radio has improved access. Um, digital is still not mature, um, but audiences are growing, and, and there are challenges with the technology. So do look behind um, what you're being told at first level because there are challenges in getting a campaign away in distribution um, but overall it offers a relatively low entry cost yep. it, it offers very high frequency it can be very highly targeted uh, because this idea of birds of a feather flocking together is true of radio stations so capital virgin xfm magic smooth um you know all of these different stations have a different profile yeah you can still buy am channels so if you're looking for an old audience you can buy gold you can buy channels based on when people were born or when they were first listening to music so you know when we're making tv ads or we're making a radio ad if we put a piece of music in it and we want to engage with a certain audience you pick the biggest number of that age break and they'll immediately identify with the music, which will bring them into your brand. So, and on radio, for a relatively low cost, you can use a very good voiceover. So immediately you're imbuing your brand with all of the qualities of that voiceover, and that allows you access to an audience and gives you permission to talk to them. Um, very short lead times. I can get you on air next week. I can make you an ad tomorrow. Um, it is relatively responsive. I think the challenge with radio is, I'm driving a car or I'm on the computer or I'm doing the ironing or I'm making food. You don't sit there and watch the radio. Mm. It's generally on whilst you're doing other things. So it's complimentary. It's also on in offices. So for a lunchtime message or a group booking message, it can be really, really useful. But creatively, it needs the extra free frequency to cut through and engage with that audience. So that's why you need that. Um, but it's great at supporting other channels. Yeah. It can be used really effectively with uh, leaflets, door drops, prints, and great with ad smart, um, and great with outdoor. So the, using outdoor and radio makes people think they've seen you on television. Um, so definitely great for local marketing as well as broader campaigns because of its selectivity. And you've got straight airtime, you've got sponsorship opportunities, own a show, build a segment. Um, you've still got opportunities to have talk ups, get the presenter talking about your product, running competitions, um, or running promotions on air, which can be linked to new products, new stores, new openings. All of that's still there. So well worth exploring, um, depending on what the brief is. Um, now a really, really great way to buy low cost radio is, is a product called the Radio Trading Desk. And it's a reversed auction bidding system where all the radio stations will put their unsold airtime into an auction. So because at the moment there are a lack of advertisers and there's lots of people listening to radio, currently you can buy this channel at about 80p per thousand which is around half of what it normally trades at. And that's half of what normal radio trades at. Yeah. So if you are supporting an event or you are opening a location and you want that reach at a reduced cost, a product like this can deliver it. You might not have the selectivity of using a capital because they're going to be fully sold on magic. Mm -hmm. But what you can get is all of those other stations in an area and just increase the instance of your brand being talked about to support your other channel. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, there are lots of people who still don't pay for Spotify. 
um, you can still buy Spotify and be one of the ads in it. Um, it's highly targeted. Um, it's got quite broad reach and it can be location, demograph or type specific and it can be visual or it can be purely audio. So another relatively low cost way to what way to schedule. Particularly complementing a digital strategy or a social strategy is you're likely to be consuming the channel whilst you're in front of your screen. You presented this to me, God, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe? I don't know. It's still I, around. <laughs> and, and, you, and you got laughed at. Um, well, I think I, everyone laughed at Spotify at the time. Yeah. It'll never work, they'll never it'll do never, it. It'll never now work. people tell me they want to be Spotify and there's only one Spotify. So yeah. Well, we tried. Those are some of the challenges. Um, I did touch on cinema very briefly. I just think it's a great opportunity now. And I think look at it based on where you are, what cinemas you've got. And think about whether you want to take a poster in the foyer, whether you want to use leafleting, or whether you want an ad in a film. It could be a really good way to deliver a really highly impactful target local to you. And again, your entry cost is, you know, five, six hundred pounds now. So, you know, I think when cinemas open again, <laughs> it's a great opportunity. Yeah. And um, we're going to talk about door drops because you know what, of all the stuff we've done and all the things we continue to do, we still get people walking into stores with leaflets more often than not. Yeah. And it's often easier for my clients to go, oh, we had lots of leaflets walk in and then, and then go, but we didn't see any of the digital marketing. So it might sound old fashioned. But actually, whether you get your teams to take an hour out of the day and cover a couple of roads, or whether you pay the Royal Mail or you take a service delivery, but the idea of putting something into doors in that catchment area for your business is fantastically viable. Um, and when I talk to friends who run small businesses and will say that the stuff I do is outside of their affordability scale, all of them predominantly still use leafleting. Whether they deliver it themselves or use jog posts or one of the other delivery methods, it's great. And you should think about it as a minimum level of support for a new location or a new area. Um, and the idea of taking a promotional team and going into businesses, fantastically valuable. Um, because obviously you've got a residential audience, which you're trying to engage with for off peak periods or weekends, but if you're trying to get that business audience, which is very hard to reach, getting brand to hand, walking into the reception, offering them a discount card, leaving a menu, doing that regularly could make a huge difference to your weekly football. Yeah. And shouldn't be ignored. Find time or find somebody who has time to do it. You know, perfect weekend, Saturday job or a grad or or wherever that extra person will come from, that's actually a great way to utilize that manpower. Um, print is not dead, it's taking a hammering. Um, digital print is helping to fill some of those channels, particularly on a local level. Um, people still trust and believe what they read in newspapers. So if you're trying to build a quality relationship with an audience and engage with them, do it in a channel which they consume readily and are heavily engaged with. And one that they choose to buy and print ticks, all of those boxes. Um, and you can use ads, you can use advertorials, you can use inserts. Um, something like an insert can be bought regionally. So let's say um, we can buy at a depot level. So if you're in, Hartlepool, I could put an insert in every national newspaper in Hartlepool. Mm -hmm. So that's a great way to get into all of those houses of people who buy the Daily Mail, the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian, the Observer. And it's a relatively low cost, give you mass distribution into people's houses. So it's a great way of using print to get into houses to support your other comms 
at a local level or at a national level, it's a great way to announce your new menu in the Sunday magazine. Smart. And engage and draw people into store with it. You know, it's beautiful, it's presented, you can talk about it, you can give it depth. And then people can come and eat it. That's really good. Um, digital. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to spend a long time on this, and I know we're kind of running out of time here, but um, there's a lot of it, and the trick is knowing what to use when. So this chart gives you a, a sense of what the full funnel looks like. Um, and this is the range of product we use in an agency for different clients. And actually, some of our clients, you know, spend anything from two to five thousand pound a month, all the way up to a couple of hundred thousand pound a month. Uh, and their money will be distributed across a wide selection of these different channels. Yeah. To reach a specific objective. And actually, it's a mix of those channels that are really important. It's not about putting everything all in one thing and it's being able to understand the value that the different channels add to that CPA or that ROI or what that end goal is. Um, and, 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 you know, I think avoid last click wins, look at the overall effect, understand the role of each mechanism. You know, I've got PPC and SEO. What does digital display offer me? How do I use social to augment that? You know, am I distributing video? Can I use CRM and community management to inform it? It's about pulling these things together. I think that that's probably the most important thing for a small to medium sized businesses, getting them all to work together. Yeah. In fact, there you go. Um, it's the sum of the parts, you know, it really is. It, it is the idea of the, the media multiplier effect. The power of two channels versus one is something the industry is absolutely firm on and has been proved thousands of times over the last 50 years. If you're in one channel and it works and you take 20% of that budget and add in a secondary travel channel, the effect you get is disproportionate to the capital investment you've put into it because the other channel is driving the other. So broadly we call it the media multiplier effect so if you've got the target market right and you understand how they consume and where they are in relation to your business, if you can layer in messages in different channels, you're reinforcing your advertising point and you're driving engagement. Are you doing that? Look at what your comms piece looks like. Think about how you could do that. Could you do it once a month, once a week, once a quarter and just give your business that extra bit of bang you know, I've just broken my sound barrier and I've just reached a whole new group of people and I've brought them into my field of reference. That's yeah. growth you wouldn't have had if you do the same thing all the time. Yeah, Mark Ritson's really big on this, the multiplier effect. And I think there's a lot of people that are choosing one, you know, social or digital or, you know, but it is, I think it's, you know, it's a market mix for a reason, right? Yeah, and I, I just think it's naive and very easy to test. Um, and they're welcome to have a debate with me about it anytime they like and see about a thousand case histories of where it's true. Yeah. Uh, very, very occasionally do we have a single medium strategy. And it really doesn't exist because nearly everybody has a website, so they're all running SEO, so they're going to have some PPC. So the next question is, well, what am I driving to my signposting? Because if you're in a, a low search channel, your budget restricted. You know, if you can only spend a grand in search because nobody's looking for you, you've got to drive search. So your next question is, what channel am I going to use to drive search? Will Facebook drive search? No, it will deliver clicks. Okay. Will outdoor drive search? Yes. So posters will drive footfall and search, depending on what you're telling people to do. So have a think about that. What are you using to drive into your business? And how do they work together? Um, you know, and what we're looking towards and working with multiple clients are is joining the dots. Yeah. How we can use automation, AI, to make things better. And I think 
small to medium sized businesses, and I know we've talked about them in the past, ones that we deal with as consumers, the ones that get it right are the ones that are texting, emailing, posting in a joined up connected manner. And I think when you've got that working well and then you drop in you know, a poster campaign or a leaflet drop, you really get that media multiplier effect and you start to get true value and understanding from your marketing mix. Um, and, and that's kind of the wish list, but it's really hard to do. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to say it's easy, but find a methodology that works. There's some great platforms out there. We work a lot with force 24 um, that are relatively low cost. They're plug and play and they allow you to engage across social search, email, mail um, and even text so for a for a small restaurant or multiple restaurants that's pretty much your main toolbox outside of special events um, or, or, or extraordinary times christmas uh, company booking birthdays summer events spring menus and that's when you would use some above the line to support that kind of channel mix um, but you know Understanding what value am I getting from email versus just pushing it out there. You would argue the same from social. Yeah. What am I getting back? 